All right, so question one. We're going to be analyzing these functions in this form, x to the power n times a minus x to the power n. Um, so as is typical of uh, paper three, we'll start out with some, some examples, build a little bit of intuition, look for patterns. The question will then basically lead you on to uh, an analysis of these types of functions and basically um, go from um, intuition using some mathematical rigor to um, make generalizations. All right, so without further ado, let's get started. Okay, question one. We're going to start off with the most simple case, which is n equals one. We need to sketch this. All right, you can put this in the GDC to give you the shape. And we need to label uh, the roots and the local maximum. You can get these also from the GDC, or you don't really need to. Should be clear, I think, that um, when x is zero, the function is zero, or when x is two, the function is zero. So those are your two roots. And because the parabola is symmetric, the maximum is when x is in the middle of zero and two, which is one. You can put that in the function and you get one. Okay, so that's the intro and we proceed now to part B where we're gonna increase n and we're gonna look for patterns here. Um, <clears throat> okay, so when n is two, the function looks like this. Again, you can put this in the GDC um, and we're looking for local maximum points, local minimum points, or points of inflection. So these are all points where the gradient is zero. The local min and max should be pretty clear. Point of inflection is where the gradient of the function is zero, but it doesn't change direction. So it's not a turning point. Okay, so we'll keep our eye out on any patterns that we notice here. When n is two, we have one local maximum. two local minimums, no points of inflection. Okay, on to n equals three, you put that in the calculator, you see that it flipped, so it's concave down now. We have one local maximum, and here instead of minimums, we have, so no minimums, and instead of minimums, we have points of inflection, two points of inflection. All right, now if uh, we're noticing patterns, we might expect that when n is four, that the function would flip up to be concave up. Now let's see if it does. Put it in your calculator, yes indeed. So this is very similar to n equal two. We have one local maximum, two local minimums, and no points of inflection. So it appears that we always have one maximum and we either have minimums or points of inflection. Okay, so the pattern seems to be holding when n is five, it's now concave down, similar to when n, is, when n was three. Here we have one local maximum, so that always seems to be the case. And in no local minimums, instead, we will have two points of inflection. Okay, so <clears throat> it appears that we have a pattern here. When n is even, the function is concave up. When n is odd, it flips to being concave down. And it's good to notice patterns, but in math, just because it looks to be a pattern doesn't mean we can say that it is. Okay, so basically what this question is going to do, it's going to lead you in 
to a process of um, using some rigor to come to some conclusions about the, these functions and what happens basically when n changes. All right. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to find the derivative, okay? And so really what this question is all about is uh, showing you how we can use the derivative uh, to analyze a function. We can find out um, a lot from the derivative. Okay. So we got to find the derivative and we need to put it in this form that they give us. Okay. So if you look at what we have, it appears that uh, using the product rule is a good idea. Okay. So we're going to split that into two pieces, basically the U and the V and there's the product rule. So it's U times DV DX plus V times DU DX. And we'll write down our U and V there and the DU DX there. Okay. And now we just have to throw these into the right place. So U times DV DX plus V times DU DX. Okay. Now it's not quite in the form that we want. Um, we're going to take some common factors out. The first one I'm going to take out is the N. So we have a, an N that we can pull outside like so. Okay, so we have the N outside and what's left is in the square brackets. Now, the next uh, thing we're going to pull outside is the X in green. So we have to think how much or how many X's can we pull out? Um, we want to take the, the biggest amount possible. So the biggest amount possible would be X to the N minus one. Okay, so we pull that outside and what's left in the square bracket, okay, there's basically two pieces in the square bracket. The left piece has one X remaining and the other one, all the X's are gone. Next common factor is the A minus X term. Again, A minus X to the N minus one is the greatest common factor. So we pull that outside. And it looks like this. And then we just combine those negative X's in the bracket, square bracket, and we get what we're looking for. All right. So it turns out that this is a very convenient form to put the derivative in because it's basically broken into different factors. All right. So, yes, there it is. Okay, so we're going to tuck that up into the corner there. And now we're on part D, and we want to find out when the derivative is equal to zero. Okay, this gives us all the critical points, min minimums, maximums, points of inflection. Okay, and because our derivative is in a nice factored form, it's pretty easy to do. All right, so we look at the first factor. If that is zero, the derivative is zero. Clear. Look at the second factor. Again, if that's zero, our derivative is zero. Same with the third factor. There it is. If that's zero, the derivative is zero. Then we just have to think about what x's will make those factors zero. For the first one, uh, if x is zero, then that factor is zero. Second one, if a is, sorry, if x is equal to a, then it's zero. And the third one, if x is a over two, then that one is also zero. Okay, so that's not bad. So these points, are 
what you could call critical points. So 0, A, A over 2. Good. Very nice. All right. Now I'm going to take a quick look at the function. I'm going to see how it behaves when A changes. This is not really part of the question. It's kind of just fun, I guess, fun to do. Um, gives a little more insight, um, but it is leading to the next part. So we're looking at the point A over 2, and it's indicated by the white dot. So as I play this out, you can keep your eye on the white dot. You can also see how the function flips up and down for odd or even ends. Uh, and notice that the, the white dot, so that's uh, A over 2, never goes below the x-axis. Right? It's actually the, um, it's always the maximum point. Okay. Oh, let's play. This is fun to make these animations, I must say. All right. That's enough, I guess. Yeah. All right. And so what we want to do again, you know, you can say it looks like it always is, but that's not really math. We have to actually do it. We have to show it with some rigor and we'll do it with algebra. So I'm going to need to show that. So the first thing we're given is that A is a positive real number. Okay. So we just put A over 2 into the function. Looks like that. Um, the second factor on the right side uh, a minus a over 2 is also a over 2. So the function is a over 2 to the 2n. Okay, and because, let's write it out properly. So because a is bigger than 0, a over 2 is bigger than 0, and a over 2 to the 2n, which is the value of the function, at a over 2, it's also bigger than 0. So we have proven what we wanted. OK. Next up, we're going to look at the point a over 4. We want our derivative. OK, why a over 4? The reason why we're looking at that is because it's midway between 0 and a over 2. So it's going to tell us something about the function in that section. All right, so all we all we do is put a over four into the derivative now, um, and we we'll just uh, you know clean up those brackets a little bit so they're easier to read. All right, that should be fine, I think. Okay, we know a is a positive, we know n is a positive integer, and so we look at all these pieces. And each one of the four pieces has to be greater than zero. That means the whole thing is greater than zero. So the derivative at a over four is always greater than zero. And that tells us something about the function, which we'll look at now. All right. So let's look at an example when n is four. OK, so we've got. Um, a over 2 marked in A. And so that's se the section between 0 and A over 2, because the derivative is always greater than 0, the function is always increasing. So that's indicated by the green section. So that is always increasing. Doesn't matter if n is even or odd. Always the case. Okay. Onward to part G. So we're looking at the value of the derivative at negative 1. It's always a good idea, I think, to think about why are they asking this? Because there's always a reason, especially on these paper threes, there's a reason why they ask these things. It is to lead you to a conclusion or a discovery. 
So the reason why they're asking for the derivative at negative one is because that's on the left side of zero. Okay. So this will tell us more about the function on the left side of zero. Okay. So this is acting kind of as a switch and it switches back and forth depending on whether n is even or odd. So if n is even, n minus one is odd. That means that negative one to the n minus one is negative one, okay? Likewise, if n is odd, n minus one is even, and so negative one to an even power is positive one. Okay, now all the other pieces of the derivative are here, and these are always positive, okay? Those are always positive because n is positive and a is positive. So that means that the, the derivative at negative one, or we could say really anything left of zero, the derivative, um, if n is even, is less than zero. If n is odd, it's greater than zero. Okay. So this tells us about whether the function is increasing or decreasing. So let's let's take a look. We'll we'll put a graph up and see what this means. Okay. So we'll look at this. N is three. Okay. So here's what the function looks like, and that section uh, left of the y-axis, right? Um, if um, n is even, sorry, if n is odd, okay, n is three here, so odd, the derivative there at negative one is greater than zero. That means the function is always increasing. I marked that in green, okay? If we look at uh, n equals four, okay? The derivative on the left side of zero is negative. That means the function is always decreasing. Mark that in red. Okay, so we're learning a lot of things here, using the derivative to help us. And then finally, we um, we're on to the last part where we need to um, we need to find the value of k that will give us four solutions, right? So you think of a, a horizontal line that will cut the graph four times, or will hit it four times. Okay. Now, before I go into that, I want to do something that is probably not required, but I think it's good to talk about, and it's easy to do. So um, I'm going to talk about the idea of symmetry. And you see I have that blue line there, x equals a over 2. It passes through the maximum and looks pretty obviously that it cuts the function in half and it looks like the left side is a reflection of the right side. Um, again, I don't, I didn't see in the mark scheme that you have to do this, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to prove that it's, that's a line of symmetry. Okay. So how can we do that? It's pretty easy. I'm going to, I'm going to take any constant C. I'm going to add it to A over 2, put it in the function, and then I'm going to uh, subtract it from A over 2, put that in the function. If those, if those two results are equal, then we know that um, that's, uh, it's a line of symmetry. So we just put those, uh, those into the function. Looks like that. Okay, I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but worth your time to to think about that. What is it? What am I saying here? And the algebra is pretty easy. So we have shown that the value of the function um, positive c from a over two is equal to the function um, negative c away from a over two. And then we can really conclude things about the left and right side. Okay, so back to our graph. Okay, 
So when when uh, n is three, we showed that um, everything to the left of zero is increasing. So that's marked in green. We showed that the 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 section from zero to a over two is also increasing. So that's marked in green. And then because of the symmetry, the other side on the right is going to be the opposite. So those that whole section to the right is decreasing. Okay. And so the derivatives are, if the derivative is greater than zero, it's increasing. If the derivative is less than zero, it's decreasing. Okay. Fine. And here is when n is even. Okay. And The green is where the derivative is greater than zero. The red is where the derivative is less than zero. Okay. So there you have it. Now, when can we get four solutions? So in other words, what, what's, what horizontal lines will hit it four times? First of all, N has to be even. If it's, if it's odd, the most solutions you could get is two. Okay, so if it's even, it's possible. And then it just has to be within this section where the line is traveling. So inside there, not equal, but inside. Yeah, that is where you will get four solutions. And so now we just do the algebra. It's greater than zero. It's, it can't be equal to zero. At zero, uh, you would have two, two solutions. Okay. And that has to be less than the function at a over two. You just put that in, and we've already done that, I think, somewhere else. And so we get our conditions on k. Again, it's, uh, it's exclusive of the maximum. Okay, because that would be three. If it was equal to a over two, it'd be um, it'd be three solutions. All right, and so finally, this is the answer. K must be um, within that range, and n must be even. And that is that is all for question one. A good investigation into Basically, like how the derivative helps, I think. That's, that's the big takeaway from there. All right, onward to number two. All right, on to question two. Here we're going to be looking at complex numbers and how they can help us analyze certain polynomials. A quick word about the term complex numbers. It is an unfortunate term because the word complex um, is associated with difficulty, confusion. It really is not necessary for that to be the case with complex numbers. Complex numbers are really interesting and amazing, and uh, they can help us do things in, in really surprising ways. And the patterns that you that you will notice here, I think you'll find interesting. All right, so this question, as usual, we'll be looking at some specific examples in the beginning. Uh, and then the question will basically guide you through, it will guide you from an intuition about what's happening into a more rigorous type of proof. All right, so clear out that word complex, they're imaginary numbers, which sounds a lot more fun and exciting. Okay, let's jump into it. All right, number two. So we have a complex number plane. The x-axis is the real numbers and the y-axis is the imaginary numbers. And I've drawn a unit circle inside there. Okay, on the left side we've got uh, z to the power n minus 1, that's the 
general case of the polynomials that we'll be looking at. Below that, um, it looks like a W, but it's actually the Greek letter omega. So I'm going to call that omega as we go through this. And that is equal to the Euler form of a complex number. So e to the 2 pi i over n. OK. We'll start by looking at a simple case where, th where n is 3. So the polynomial is z cubed to minus 1. And we're going to be looking at the roots of that. So when is z cubed to minus 1 equal to 0? Or you could say z cubed equals 1. OK. So on the complex number plane, we can plot the roots. The first root is p sub 0, and that is equal to 1. And that's pretty clear, because 1 cubed equals 1. So that's a root. OK. Now the next two are complex numbers. And these can be gotten um, on this complex number plane by just doing a rotation of this angle theta. Where does the angle theta come from? It's a full circle, 2 pi, divided by n. So in this case, if n is 3, we basically split this circle into three equal pieces. And at each point there, p0, p1, p2, those are all roots. OK, now let's just, let's just look at the rotation here. We go from p0 to p1. It's rotated 2 pi over 3. That is the root omega to the power 1, and that's the Euler form. All right. To get the next root, p2, we rotate twice that angle. So omega squared is equal to e uh, to the power 2 times the angle, right, times i. We could uh, rotate again. Basically, it would be omega to the power 3. But that would just bring us back to p zero, right? So it's just going to start repeating. So there's only three distinctive roots. OK, let's look at four. So same story. The angle of rotation now is 2 pi over 4. So that's 90 degrees. And so we hit our roots at every 90 degrees. So there's omega to the power 1. We double the angle now. It's omega squared. This is an interesting one to look at because in the Euler form, we have a 4, in the numerator 4 and the denominator, so they cancel. And so we have e to the pi i. And if you look at p2, that's at the point negative 1. So this shows us actually that famous Euler um, equation, which is e to the pi i equals negative 1, which is really pretty remarkable that you have these um, irrational numbers, e and pi, and then the square root of negative 1. And it, all that equals uh, negative 1. Remarkable. Final root, p3. We have to rotate 3 times 90. So. Here's what omega-3 looks like. All right. Now I'm going to just proceed a little bit further just to gain some insight, some intuition about what happens with um, complex numbers and actually why they're, like, they're not complex. They're actually they're really cool. All right. So if n is 5, so we split the circle into 5 equal pieces. And what I want to show you here now is if, okay, I'm going to circle those two roots, p1 and p4. Those are conjugates, okay? The real piece is equal, right? They're at the same place on the, the real side, the real number line. And uh, the imaginary pieces are opposite in sign. They're equal but opposite in sign. So if I add those together, the imaginary piece will cancel. And since they're conjugates, if you multiply them, the imaginary pieces will also cancel. 
Uh, so what else can we notice here? P2, P3, those are conjugates. All right, let's uh, look at another one. N is six. All right. Now, when N is an even number, by the way, it's, it's perfectly symmetrical. You may, may have noticed that for N is four. And when they're odd, they're not symmetrical. Um, not in this way. Okay, so again, let's we'll circle a couple of these. P1, P5, those are conjugates. Um, and then P2 and P4 are also conjugates. And, and here, I think it becomes clear that if you add all these roots together, that the imaginary pieces will cancel because you have those two sets of, two, two pairs of conjugates. Also, the real parts will cancel. Okay, you see the like P zero is one and P three is negative one. Those cancel, and so you add those all up, you get zero. We'll do one more. We'll look at n is seven. Again, we have pairs of conjugates, and it's not as clear as it is with um, even numbers for n. But the real parts also cancel here. So if you add up all the real parts, the values of the real parts of these numbers, add them all up, you get, you get zero. Okay, that's just kind of neat. Not really useful in this. Well, I mean, we are actually going to talk about that. Yeah, sorry. Okay, now the first thing we need to do is just a little bit of algebra, get you, get you warmed up here. This is nothing big. We have uh, this that we want to prove, and we're going to use, we're going to expand the brackets. Okay, when you expand brackets, just be careful that you, you catch all the pieces. There should be six here, because it's two elements times three elements. All right, and then we have some things that cancel out. The, the purple pieces cancel out, and the green pieces cancel out. And so we're left with what we wanted. Good, a nice start. Next, okay, so that's, there's a, next what we want to do is show that, okay, we, I've, I've got two factors here, right? And I want to show that the second one, omega squared plus omega plus one is zero. And so how do we do that? Okay. We know that omega is not one, right? If you think back on the complex number plane, the first root was one. The next root was a rotation. So it was definitely not one. It was some complex number. Or if it was power two, it could have been all the way to the negative one. But it's not going to be one. Okay. So because omega is not one, the left side factor of omega minus one is not zero, which means that the right side factor, omega squared plus omega plus one must be zero. That's the only way to make that equation true. Okay, so we've shown that two parts of uh, A. Now we move to B, and in B, we're gonna be multiplying uh, the magnitude of these line segments, let's say, or vectors. We could think of them as vectors or line segments. So P0, P1 is the line segment there. P0, P2 is that line segment. I'm going to draw them as vectors. Okay, And basically, we're going to take the lengths of these sides and multiply them. All right, and there are a number of ways to do this. I'll go through a couple um, and you decide what you like. Okay, let's think of it geometrically and trigonomic trigonometrically. So we draw a triangle and we pull it out here. Let's rotate it so we've got that length as the base. 
So that's what we're trying to find, that length d. And you may notice that if I cut this in half, we get that fairly famous triangle, the 30, 60, 90. Okay. So that's it's scaled up a bit, but that's basically the triangle that I pulled out cut in half. Okay, so then we can just use uh, basic trig. Okay, now I want to show actually here. All right, we slide that triangle back in, and you notice that that distance D from P0 to P2 is the same as the distance of P0 to P1, which makes sense because of the symmetry of, of um, this diagram. Okay, so those two lengths are the same, and we can just get one now and square it. Okay, so let's go through the algebra. Okay, so this is from the 30, 60, 90. So half of the distance that I'm looking for is the square root of 3 over 2. Okay, that's from the 30, 60, 90 tri uh, triangle. And then so obviously D is equal to the square root of 3. And then that's, that's what we're looking for. That's one of the pieces. So that line segment, P0, P1, is square root of 3. And then by symmetry, P0, P2, it's also square root of 3. And if I multiply them together, I get 3. All right, that was nice. Okay, now let's, uh, let's look at a, uh, as far as vectors go, and this is useful because we'll be doing this later. Okay, so that line segment, P0, P1, or P0, P2, they're the same. That line segment is equal to the magnitude of the difference of those two vectors. So it's 1 minus omega. Okay, the magnitude of that vector. So there's a, as I said, a number of ways to do this. We can look at the what's called the cis um, notation, just so you get a, you know, a look at all the different ways these things can be written. Okay, so we have the magnitude of 1 minus omega. So omega in the cis form is cosine of the angle plus sine i times sine of the angle. Okay. Uh, did I get those signs right? I hope so. I think I should have brackets around the cosine and the sine. Yeesh. Okay. Yeah. All right. So these, um, the cosines and the sines, you can get this from your calculator or from the 30, 60, 90 triangle, basically. Okay. So just going through the magnitude calculation, you should definitely work this out on paper on your own. But we're showing here now that the length of one of those line segments is the square root of 3, and then they're equal, so you would square it and get 3. All right. There's one other way, which probably the easiest just use your calculator all right and so we have 1 minus omega the magnitude of that times the magnitude of 1 minus omega squared and if you just punch that into the calculator you get 3 so you should try that okay Next up, okay, we want to factorize this omega to the power of 4 minus 1. Okay, so the first thing that I saw here is that 
It's a difference of two squares. Again, there's probably other ways to do it. Okay, but the difference of squares is like something you get so used to seeing that it's worth going down that road, I suppose. Okay, and then we have another difference of, okay, first I guess we should say omega to the power four, so is that's a root, so omega to the power four is equal to one. So basically on the left side we have one minus one. On the right side now I've got uh, the first factor, the omega squared minus one. That's also a difference of two squares. So let's do that. All right, good. And then I just switched the order there, no big deal. And I'm approaching this, which should look good. This is what we're looking for. All right, so just expand those last two brackets. And then, again, this is very similar to what we just did. Since omega is not one, the other factor must be zero. So this is what I was talking about, adding up all the roots, right? We're actually showing that they're equal to zero. All right, or here's another way we could do it. Again, basically you can just put those in your calculator or you could go to the to the number plane and like you could just see where these roots land because for power four it's it's um very easy to read them off the off the grid okay so you have yeah um negative i negative one positive i positive one add them all up you get zero So there's all these different ways to look at these things and they all kind of converge and start to make some sense and we remove that complexity. Okay, onward. Now we're gonna look at what we just did for N3, the magnitude or the length of these line segments. We're gonna multiply them all together, Let's see what we get. Okay, so I'm gonna do, I'm drawing these as vectors and these lengths are pretty obvious because the first one, P0, P1, is the diagonal of a one by one square, right? So we know that's square root of two. P0 to P2 obviously is length two. You can see it's one plus one. And then um, P3 is the same as P1 by symmetry. And so there we have our result. Four. Looks like a pattern developing. You could also just use your GDC and you put in the magnitudes of magnitude of those vectors. And boom. You get the answer. Nice. I would recommend actually, since you're prat your looking at this to practice, obviously, is that you do these problems in more than one way. If there's a couple ways to do it, try both ways, and then you'll be able to, to see what makes more sense to you and what's quicker, what's easier. So experiment. All right, so this is the, these are the results. They tell us that in fact, with n is five, we get that result. And now they're asking us for a conjecture. And honestly, like there's only one possible thing. It's kind of a weird question. There's no way you can really get this wrong, I think. I mean, there's if you're gonna guess what that's equal to, there's no th other thing you could guess other than n. It just, you know, there's no other possible guess. All right, anyway, this is what they're doing. They're leading you into a generalization. It's a nice question. I really, I like these paper threes. 
All right. So now we are approaching the end zone. And again, this is just, there's not much to this question. This is uh, the part F. Um, this is just the notation that we're using that line, the line segment P0, P1 is equal to the magnitude of the, the difference of the two vectors, right? One minus omega and so on. P2 is to omega squared, P3 is to omega cubed, and then it's reasonable to say that if uh, we're going to P n minus one, that's magnitude of one minus omega n minus one, to the n minus one. Yeah. Okay. Now, all these things that they're asking you to do, you should expect that you're going to use that, right? And this is kind of the, the culmination of the question comes in part G, doing a proof. All right. So this is just algebra. We're going to, I'm going to throw some equations your way. So buckle up, here they come. Um, they give a, they say, consider this. We got to take that as a given. It's pretty clear that that's true. I think if you multiply the Z through and then you multiply the negative one through, everything will cancel except the first and the last term. So you end up with Z to the power N minus one, but to go through it and, you know, prove it to yourself. All right. Now, I'm going to write z to the power n minus 1 in a different way. I'm going to write it um, in factors, right? So z minus the root times z minus the next root times z minus the next root. So what all that is, so z minus 1, that's the first root, z minus omega, second root. So it's basically the polynomial in factorized form. Okay. So I have it written in two different ways, and I'm going to set those two things equal. Okay. Now I've got the first factor indicated in pink, and this is... Um, I am a little bit troubled <laughs> by the, the, the next move that I'm going to make. So I'm, I'm throwing those two common factors out. I'm basically dividing by it. Okay, and so we're left with that equation. Okay, so far so good. Now, I'm saying let z equal one. Why am I doing that? Because if I look at the, the right side, okay, if I put one in for z, I'm gonna have one minus omega times one minus omega squared Okay, and that looks very, very close to what I'm looking to prove, right? I'm trying to prove that, um, you know, the P0, P1 times P0, P2 is equal to N. So that, that looks like um, one side of what I want. Now, I'm troubled by this thing of letting Z equal 1 because I just divided by z minus one. And if someone smarter than me maybe can comment in the comment section. This is, as far as I understand the mark scheme, basically what they did. And I don't know if it's okay because, or maybe I didn't understand the mark scheme, that could be two, but if z is 1, then z minus 1 is 0, and then doesn't that mean that I divided by 0? I don't know. Now, here's the thing. If you're troubled by this, um, you're in an exam, right? And so, like, you're not, this is not a journal where, like, if you put something false, your reputation is going to be destroyed. You know, this is just, uh, like, you're trying to get marks. And the worst thing that can happen is they don't give you a mark. Like they're not going to say this was dishonest. Um, so what I would say is if you're troubled by this, 
then you're like you're a good mathematician and you're probably going to go further in math than I've ever gone and you're probably maybe going to find out you know what was a better way to do do this so my my advice here is like if you've gotten this far and you're troubled by this the last question on paper 3 you probably have a 7 already and like don't be so troubled by it that you don't answer it or you know probably you have a better way so anyway here's my way i put 1 in for z and so if i do that here's what it looks like i get all these ones on the left side there are n of them and then i got the right side which is approaching what i'm what i want okay so the left side okay okay first i'm going to take the um, absolute value of everything here this that won't change the equality okay so the absolute value of the left side that's still n obviously and on the right side the absolute value of each factor okay and so we have n equals that and that by part e i think we can write it in that form and that's that's what we wanted to prove okay so that's it um that little move there with the z equal one still bothers me but i use both my brain cells and i can't uh in fact, I tried, uh, I thought of induction that didn't work. So um, anyway, that's what the comment section is for. I'm sure somebody will have a good idea there. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, that's it for this paper and more to come, I hope. Thanks.